Jason, just one Don't just give him a moment. Right. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, just wanted to touch next on your research in relation to pharmaceutical companies. Yes. Um, you've identified in your statement you've had a particular interest in looking at the role of pharmaceutical companies. You've talked earlier today about you seeing products as being one of the central issues for, for, for exploration. Um, before I ask you a couple of questions about the responses you've had from pharmaceutical companies, what's the, um, the, the focus or nature of your research been, broadly speaking? Very difficult, because pharmaceutical companies obviously are not subject to FOI, for instance. One of the things I did notice in the HIMA 22.1 series we were talking about was there was a significant lack of that kind. That, that was the kind of documentation I thought should have been there that wasn't. So for a lot of that kind of research, it's been based in either books, such as the uh, Douglas Starr book that people will be familiar with, but also our friends overseas. In particular, uh, the US lawyer Eric Weinberg and uh, his journalist friend Donna Shaw have been particularly helpful to me. And um, Eric has even posted uh, you know, documents physically. He's a, a paper man, I think, rather than digital as I as I am and um, so he has posted pharma memos depositions etc to to my house um, Donna Shaw has sent me things as well so so and others uh, blood watch in Canada um, who are a campaign group that focuses on keeping paid plasma out of Canada today in present time um, and others too, you know, there's, there's a number of people internationally that have been very helpful. Um, you, um, you've said in your witness statement that you've found what you described as an unspoken wall of silence in relation to pharmaceutical company, as companies and their role. What did you mean by that? As much as I and many others may criticise the government, the Department of Health, about this issue, I think they at least accept that it happened. And we can give them that. But when it comes to the pharmaceutical companies, I think the primary wall that we face is the denial of their involvement or responsibility before you even get into the realms of causation or negligence or anything else. It, it, it's that denial of any involvement from some of these companies. And it is complicated by the fact that many of the then companies have been sold, merged, spun off. I understand that. But I think that the Revlon example is, is a good one of where those issues are at play. But there needs to be an acceptance that a company's history did involve people suffering serious harm and dying. And you can't just focus on the good stuff as though, as much as though, as someone in marketing and PR, I understand it's not a good look. In, in relation to Revlon, um, I'll, I'll refer in a moment to a witness statement we've had on behalf of Revlon Inc., the, the current incarnation. Yes. Um, um, but you, you, I think, flagged up uh, um, a memo from 1986 that you wanted to refer to. That's JEVA 5084. So the only reason I 
wanted to refer to this document is not in relation to its general content, but it's what's in the top left corner, which clearly says Revlon Healthcare UK Limited. But as well as that is where it says Revlon, the logo is the same logo that Revlon Inc. used today, which is characterized by that interlocking LO. That is the Revlon logo that's in use today, and that, that can be seen on JEVA62. So five zeros and then 62. And in the left hand corner. It's clearly derived from that same Revlon logo, whether it's Revlon Inc. or Revlon anything else, as, as evidenced in what this document actually is. This is, as of April this year, the history of Revlon on the Revlon website, which starts at 1910. So on Revlon's website, they claim the full history of Revlon going back to 1910. I don't think there's any particular need to go through the whole timeline. It's pretty, you know, extensive. It might be worth looking at page five of this document, though, which is in relation to 1932, where it says Revlon is founded. So on their website, they say that Revlon was founded in 1932. And that's Revlon Inc. saying this. And of course, there's absolutely no mention of the contaminated blood scandal in their timeline, but I don't think anyone would really expect that. And I, and I contrast in my statement the fact that on, when it suits Revlon for the purposes of marketing, they claim their history going to 1932. But in the email sent to my legal representatives, they say otherwise. And that, I think, is WITN 12100034. It's the bottom of the page that you're referring to there, Jason, yes? Yes, this email was sent to my legal representatives by Revlon's general counsel in New York upon them finding out about the protests that Factor 8 had organised outside of Revlon's London uh, headquarters in, I think, 2018. And what they essentially say here is that Revlon Inc. has no connection to the events of the 80s, to, to summarize it. They say they have no connection to Armour Pharmaceutical Company and describe the various commercial sales of, of Armour. And so the, the point that I draw is to the final paragraph there. They say the current Revlon Inc. was created on April the 24th, 1992. But then as I pointed out on their website, they say Revlon was founded in 1932, not 1992. I understand that they seek to draw a distinction between Revlon Inc. and Revlon as a whole. It gets very confusing. But needless to say, I think they have to claim the full history of this company, which does include the infection of thousands globally with HIV and the associated deaths. Or they don't claim anything before 1992. I don't think they should be able to pick and choose their history. I think that's all I have to say about Revlon. And, and I, I should note, and I know you're aware of this, Jason, um, that, that as a matter of record, the inquiries received um, a statement in response to, to, to your statement in, on, on, in this regard from Reginda Bassey, litigation partner at Kirkland and Ellis International LLP, representing Revlon Inc. Um, 
they say, or he says in that statement, Revlon Inc. is a global company focused on beauty products. It is certainly not a pharmaceutical company. Um, they wish to say that the email that we've just looked at wasn't, um, w wasn't a, th a threat, veiled or otherwise, in terms of um, uh, legal action or legal threat, and that Revlon Inc. has never had ownership of armour and that can be published in due course on the inquiry website in accordance with the way in which we would normally um, disclose and publish such uh, documents. Yes. Um, and then just bef before we move on from pharmaceutical companies, you've also exhibited WITN 12100030. Some other communications. Um, I think if we go to the third page, there's a communication from Pfizer. Um, saying um, we were not involved in the contaminated blood scandal. Um, and from Merck over the page... Um, drawing, I think, a distinction between Merck, an affiliate of Merck Darmstadt, Germany, and Merck & Co. Inc., um, trading as MSD or Merck Sharp & Dome. Um, was there any... Uh, is it the same theme, or was there a particular observation you wish to make in relation to the, those two entities? Yeah, I, I submitted these just to highlight, you know, the... I think it's hard enough having to deal with the issues that are obvious that have impacted this community. It's hard enough having to campaign against powerful organisations that would rather we didn't exist. But then you get these veiled threats of legal action from... I mean, it's clear the, these, you know, defamatory article from... Merck and Pfizer and then you know Revlon can say what they want but to, to me you know Revlon's lead counsel in New York doesn't email my legal representation about me to say that they hope I have a nice summer it was clearly a veiled message that they, they didn't like the, the protest that we'd organised and so I just wanted to highlight that in the face of everything else we also have to deal with this kind of stuff and um you also raised in your statement, and I think, again, it's been a theme of some of the campaigning and in investigative and work you've undertaken, the issue of pharmaceutical funding for um, organisations and individuals. So you've identified concerns about funding provided to UKHCGO by pharmaceutical companies, the Haemophilia Society, public bodies, in individual clinicians. Um, two matters I wanted to ask you about that really again in, in fairly broad terms you've said in your statement that you've seen in, re in your research that historically commercial influences have led to poor decision making and worse mm -hmm. um, can, can you flesh that out a little and uh, help us understand what you're referring to there well I think if you if you look at the pharmaceutical company documents I, I know that the inquiry has a large selection of the ones that I believe originated from the US firm Baum Headland. And also, there's, a, there's an, an incredible document called The Trail of AIDS, which was put together by um, a US campaigner, Dr. Dana Kuhn. And it's, in my view, obvious to look through those documents without going to any, that the overriding concern of the commercial organizations as... Uh, you might expect was to make money and then that that goal of making money outrid concerns to do with safety and what is best for the patient an area that I haven't um, I feel been able to reach the end of is I've seen at the point in time, which I think is 
mid to late 70s where the purchase of commercial concentrates was by the way of central contracts from the Department of Health and not by individual centres. I've always wanted to see the terms of those contracts. I've, ever se I've only ever seen kind of the, just a, like a purchase order that refers to the central contract. I've never seen the terms and conditions related to it. I, I would like to see those if they exist. And I, I wonder what factors the terms of those central contracts that the Department of Health may have played in the decisions made to continue importing product when it was known it was less safe. But then having said all that, to go slightly off topic for a second, I do fully subscribe to the theory that I think Bruce touched on earlier in the week, that yes, self-sufficiency, it's an argument in terms of HIV, but my belief is that concentrate products, untreated, unpasteurized in general, should never have been allowed to have been used until it was at least th reasonably thought that they were safe. And, and I think it's clear that they were never thought to be safe. The, 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 the second point in, in relation to pharmaceutical funding is, um, you, you talked in your statement about that, your concern that historically that led to bad decisions, but you continue to raise it as a current concern. Why is that, and, and, and is, is, is not the question of pharmaceutical funding for such or for organisations or individuals not addressed if it's transparent, if everyone knows that X body or X doctor has received a certain amount of money from a, a named pharmaceutical company? Why, why is that not enough? I think it depends on the setting, and particularly when you're dealing with this issue. It's not only about actual conflict but also about perceived conflict. And I think sometimes it's easier for our community to see that as opposed to those in power, where if it was the other way around, I'm sure um, it wouldn't be looked upon nicely. I suppose, as an example, I'm sure it wouldn't be seen as fair by the Department of Health for me to sit on the inquiry's expert panel of whatever, talking about whether or not it was appropriate for certain products to be used at certain times, because I'm clearly biased. So when it comes to things like pharmaceutical funding, if an organization is taking funding, I think if it's spelt out exactly what it's for, then maybe that helps but there's still the perception of it. And, and by that, I mean, let's say with the Haemophilia Society, for example, in Revlon's uh, response to criticism we were just talking about, they say in there that, as far as they're concerned, ultimate responsibility for armor now rests with the pharmaceutical company uh, Sanofi. If, without looking at the Haemophilia Society's latest reports, but if the Haemophilia Society then accepts financial contribution from Sanofi and, and has this relationship with them, when, in my view, this company still has not had justice and redress in relation to armour, I would suggest that a more appropriate approach would be to say to Sanofi, that we want nothing to do with you. We will not promote your products or your open days or anything you do until you deal with this long-standing issue where people have been seriously injured and have died because of the actions of a company that you're now responsible for. I don't buy into the notion that was mentioned about, well, if we can get 10 grand out of them, then that's good for us because we can use that money to do some good. I mean, what, what's 10 grand to this community? It's nothing. You know, factor eight in our latest fundraiser, and we don't have any paid employees, we don't have any fundraisers, by me putting a post on Facebook, we raised four grand in 30 days. Now, it's a small amount of money, 
but it goes to show that it's not actually that hard to raise money when you've got a cause that people believe in. And, and I, I, don't, I don't buy into the fact that these things can't exist without farmer money. I think, I think they can, and I think it's defeatist. And perhaps you've got the wrong employees. If, if you can't do that, I think there are talented marketeers that, that could do that. Um, next topic I wanted to ask you about is, is um, I guess an, it could be described as another form of campaigning or investigation, and that's the, the trying to find out answers same address the making of complaints um, or asking bodies to investigate matters yes um, and there were just three I wanted to touch on I'm, I'm only going to go in, in any detailed sense to, 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 to the third the first is in relation to the police you say in your statement you made contact with the West Midlands police and then the Metropolitan Police because you wanted to raise issues relating to potential criminal liability in relation to contaminated blood uh, what, what response did you get? When I contacted the West Midlands police, I don't know if you want me to mention the specific allegation and the name of you, the person. It's a matter of public record. It's not redacted in your statement. You're free to mention it. So going back, I believe, to the late 70s, very early 80s, there was an individual, a Dr. Mark Patterson, who was stealing blood plasma and selling it to what was the equivalent then of Novo Nordisk now, stealing British plasma at a time when we were trying to achieve self-sufficiency and selling it overseas on the black market. Dr. Mark Patterson was tried at the Old Bailey and he was convicted of criminal theft. Upon learning about this, and keeping in mind that was considered at the time in terms of a theft and nothing more, and I don't know what the law is uh, around criminal trials and if they can be opened back up in, in certain ways or not, but morally I felt, at least, that given what we know now about self-sufficiency and the way things could be different in terms of people died, no doubt, because we weren't self-sufficient, and they wouldn't have died if we were, I felt that maybe I could try and entertain the police in the idea that Dr. Mark Patterson's case should be reconsidered in different terms, because his actions arguably could have led to deaths. I contacted the West Midlands Police about that, whether they were the correct organisation or not, I don't know, but they were my local police force. The, and, and, and whether or not that was the specific allegation raised or not, the response was, I heard some tapping of keys on the keyboard, um, and whatever search term the um, woman on the phone had put into her computer, the, the response I was given was that, oh, there, there was this inquiry, the Archer inquiry into this stuff. It's been dealt with already. And I was trying to then explain, no, no, this, what I'm saying to you is, was not considered by Archer. This is nothing, it's not nothing to do with it, but it, it, it wasn't considered by Archer. And I was trying to explain to her it wasn't a statutory inquiry. You can't rely on that inquiry as some kind of official in, investigation into these matters. But it was, the answer was, no, 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 this has been dealt with. This is... You know, didn't want to know. Goodbye. And then, I, and then I did try and raise the same issue with the Met Police as well over the phone. And um, to be fair, the response was slightly better, in that the person I spoke to took some notes and said he'd refer it to the relevant department. Um, I did ask if there was any way he could give me some kind of reference number so that I could maybe follow it up and see if there was an update or what they decided to do with it. But he said, no, we, we don't do that. I'll, I'll pass the information on. And he was quite adamant that there was no way he could give me any kind of reference number to follow it up. So I, I never received any kind of update either. So I, I take it that went no further either. Um, so that was my experience with the police. And then um, in relation to Dr. Reshman, you have made a complaint to the General Medical Council. Yes. 
and the response you've received from the General Medical Council, um, I mean, we've, we've got it, so we can go through it if necessary, but I don't, probably don't need to, is that they, they've placed any in investigation on hold pending the outcome of this inquiry, is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and then the third um, area of complaint I was going to ask you about was the health ombudsman. Yes. Um, perhaps we, we'll look at a couple of documents in relation to this. So JEVA 5023, please. Oh, in fact, I think we can probably go to, to JEVA 5024 because that's the covering letter rather than the report. So just so that we can understand this, the complaint is by you, it's about University Hospitals, Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust, and it's about your father's record, is that right? Yes, this, this date backs, dates back to what some people will remember was, was ventilated in the, the 2017 BBC Panorama documentary where the Trust had told me for well over a year that not only did they not hold records for my father, but he, that he was never a patient there. And they had told me this many times. In, I, I would make in-person visits over the phone, email correspondence. I had asked over and over and over again. Same response every time. In the run-up to BBC Panorama being aired, the producers sent a right of reply to the trust saying basically that Jason says he's tried to get the records for every year you say you don't have them just want to make sure this is the case within a day of that happening the trust had gone back to the BBC saying oh we've just found three volumes of Jonathan Evans's medical records and bear in mind, the Trust never told me. The BBC told me. I then had to apply to the Trust to get the records, and eventually, <laughs> months later, I did get them. But this complaint was hinged off the fact that following all that, I wrote to the Trust saying that I wanted a full explanation of what had happened and why I'd asked for so long that they, and they'd already and they'd always said they didn't have them. And then within a day of the BBC asking, they all magically turn up. I got many different stories, well, three different stories, I believe, which are outlined in this complaint. And, and I, I'm not sure if we need to go to specific bits, but the long and short of it is that the ombudsman did find the trust um, guilty of maladministration as outlined at the start of paragraph one. Um, and... and um I don't think it makes any difference at all to the point that you're making, Jason, but just as a matter of strict technical accuracy, I think they say the Trust found the records within two days. So within two days of being contacted by the BBC, but the, your point is the same. Yes. Um, so the, the Ombudsman's found maladministration, that was February of this year. Um, what, what's happened since then? Well, in the... I think it might be at the end of this report... We go to page six, please, um, Chemic. We can see the recommendations. Yes. So in, in the recommendations, there's a part where they say that the trust needs to come up. Uh, it's paragraph 34. We recommend that within two months of the date of the final report, the trust prepare an action plan, including what it sets out there. And this report report was date I don't know if we can go back to when it was dated on the um, 20 the decisions the 26th of February 2021 and that's also the date of the letter to you yeah and um, which says I've also sent a copy to the trust and so as of today that has not happened and I actually received an update last night from the ombudsman out of the blue um, saying that they still have not heard anything from the trust. Um, off the top of my head, I believe he, the ombudsman has said that they'll give them a couple of weeks, and if nothing further happens, it will be escalated. Um, 
wanted to then move to um, back to the question of ministers and ministerial interactions. Um, I'll start by, um, well, it, referring to, to some documents, two documents that you were highlighted in a Guardian article this week, but the first document takes us back to 1983. DHSC three zeros three eight two four underscore one seven eight, please. Show me. Um, now, this is a letter, the 4th of May, 1983. Um, we, the inquiry, have it as material provided to us by the Department of Health. But how did you obtain the material? Was that, again, through Freedom of Information? No, this, this um, is in one of the LIE series of documents which have not, up until this inquiry getting off the ground being at the National Archive and um, well, my, my suspicion is that the, uh, the inquiry had sight of those documents and then afterwards they, they've ended up in, in the National Archives. I, I don't believe those documents have in full been disclosed to any of the core participants at this stage, only one of the LIE series, but um, I'd gone physically to the National Archives in, in the light of waiting for, for that disclosure from the inquiry. I thought it might be helpful to our legal team to go physically to the National Archives to get them faster from there. So uh, I'd been doing that, and, and, and whilst doing that, um, this was one of the sets of files that, that, that I'd got physically from the archive. And we can see, if we just go to the top of the page, it's from Hugh Rossi, MP, 4th of May, 1983. It's addressed to a constituent, a Mr Spencer, and we can see from the second paragraph that Mr. Rossi is a minister in the Department of Health and Social Security, but on the social security side. Um, and you've noted, uh, um, I think, and drawn attention to the last paragraph of the letter, which says, as regards AIDS, I will ask for figures if they're available and agree with you that it is an extremely worrying situation, particularly as I read in the weekend press that the disease is now being transmitted by blood plasma, which has been imported from the United States. Yes. Now, as I understand it, Jason, please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. You've attached significance to this document in two ways. The first is to juxtapose what's said here by Mr. Rossi with the, the Department of Health line of no conclusive proof. Yes, and, and in particular in the Guardian article, it, it, it was drawn with Ken Clark's statement in the November of 83, saying there's no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted by blood products. And, and we'll no doubt be looking in later inquiry hearings and with later witnesses at precisely those types of statements in, in 83 and 84. Yes. Um, so that's the first point you've made about it. But the, the second point you've made about this letter requires us to look at um, documents from 1990, DHSC 004642 underscore 084, please. And we can see that the date is the 22nd of March 1990. It's a letter from a Mr. Burridge in the Department of Health, or a Ms. Burridge, a DE Burridge in any event in the Department of Health to the Treasury Solicitor. And it's about the HIV haemophilia litigation, the process of discovery, so the process of providing documents to the other side, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Th th there's a number of observations about documents that they propose to hold back on grounds of privilege or um, for other reasons, and we'll no doubt want to perhaps again look at those in later in inquiry hearings as well. But for present purposes, if we go to the second page... it up at the top of the page. Finally, two documents which we think would fall into the third category. We would like to withhold, but it is questionable whether privilege could be substantiated. First is a minute from, from 1978. And then the second is the Hugh Rossi letter that you dug out of the LIE files. Yes. With the observation being the problem with this letter is that the minister appears to be saying or reporting from what he has read in the press that AIDS was being transmitted by blood plasma at a time 
when statements were being made that there was no conclusive evidence that this was so. Yes, and I mean clearly the, the importance of this is that, you know, I, I think many of those in our community and, and, and perhaps the, the inquiry would say that um, there was awareness of AIDS in blood products long before even the May of 83. But the, the importance that I attach to this is that it, it is a government minister saying that, and clearly the Department of Health, Treasury, sister, you know, discussing the fact that uh, that's not going to look very good to have two different government ministers saying different things, and particularly the fact that Hugh Rossi is saying this many months earlier as well. I, c I can see why, why that, that, that would be concerning to them and, and again it just goes back to this question of transparency it's 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 not there and, and I, I suppose I'll, I'll leave it for other people to to consider how appropriate this potential exercise is in in the face of litigation and your point as I understand it is is in relation to this not it's not just you drawing the line between the two dots um between what Mr. Rossi was saying and what Mr. Clark and others were saying. Yes. It, it, the Department of Health itself in 1990 is drawing the same line between the same two dots. Yes, exactly. D do you know, and you may, you may well not know, I ask this only because I don't currently know the answer but and haven't had an opportunity to try and find out yet, um, whether that document was withheld from the HIV litigation disclosure or not? The, the problem I, I have in, in answering that question at, at this moment, I, I think the answer to that can be found in material we may have acquired out, elsewhere, and I'm, I'm not sure what the... That's fine. I understand. Um, the, the next topic, um, again, still just sticking with issues relating to ministers, it's two, two further matters. One, I think, will require, will require us to go to a document, the other won't. Um, you, you've talked in your statement about... One, again, another of the strategies you've deployed, and, and indeed we've heard many others, campaigners, I think, um, uh, and individuals talking about deploying the same tactics, um, writing to ministers, raising matters with ministers. And you've said that the, that the response that you often get is that the issues are not addressed, and what you get is what you describe as a diversion or a deflection or an obfuscation. Yes. Um, I mean, you've given an example, I think, in the material you've exhibited, which is there's a letter from a minister, I think, O'Shaughnessy, and a letter from Jeremy Hunt, and I think you've deconstructed them and provided a re your own analysis, which um, I think was sent off to the minister. I don't think we need to go to that, but um, it, it's the broader point that, that you have not felt that there are, as this right, clear and comprehensive answers which actually address fully the points that are raised. Totally. Um, and it can be seen not only in that documentation, which is, is really, and uh, amazingly, I was amazed at that point in time that they began to argue with me, which I thought was great, on the, on the technical aspects of, you know, heat treatment and all, all these other issues, um, rather than just giving a, 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 a generic response. But, but you see it in all the other aspects as well, you know. I, just as a, an example, there was a recent letter that, that Tony Ferruja and Lauren Palmer sent to, I believe, Penny Mordant about the, the lack of inclusion of those that have lost parents or those that have lost children in, in the current support mechanism. And the response that came back just completely didn't deal with the issues they'd actually raised. Um, and, and, and made the suggestion that to do that, it said we are not considering any structural reform at this time. It left me thinking, why is that structural reform as, as opposed to the recent announcement and the things that have been changed? What is structural reform and what is what, whatever they're, they're suggesting it isn't? And, and that's just commonplace. I think every, maybe everyone... Uh, sitting here that's impacted by these events that's wrote to the Department of Health or the Cabinet Office will have written a letter where they then get a response and say well that didn't answer my question 
that didn't address my issue. That's just par for the course. But that, I think, takes me very neatly to my penultimate topic for you, which is about financial support and compensation. Um, and, and there are two strands to that that I want to ask you about. First of all, in your statement, you say that, um, that, that you factor eight a campaign for compensation to be paid on a proper legal basis similar to the Republic of Ireland. I think you were giving that as an example rather than a model that must be followed. Um, what, again, just in broad terms, what, what have, did, did you see as the advantages of, of such a scheme and, and what response, if any, had that campaign um, uh, resulted in? Well... It, it was myself that in, in the January 2020 meeting with Oliver Dowden and Nadine Doris put forward this notion that they should be engaging with us on a compensation framework now and I was supported in that by, by a number of individuals that, that were there and, and, and what followed. We were pushing that because of the fact that well on, on one hand because we now have the public inquiry and the nature of our goals was public inquiry compensation accountability we had the public inquiry which to some extent will help with the third point of accountability and so it was seen that in the meantime let's go after the compensation point push that um the current exercise announced around that, it did catch us off guard. Um, we, I don't think we were expecting such an exercise to be announced. Um, I think we saw it working differently, but needless to say, we, wel we welcome it. Um, as regards to the Republic of Ireland, ultimately, you know, what we're campaigning for. We, we believe um, people are entitled to common law damages. I think what's, what's important about the Republic of Ireland scheme, and again, I know that Tony Ferrugia touched on this in his closing remarks when he gave evidence, is that in terms of those who have died, the claim is treated as if they are not for the purposes of the full assessment of their damages. Now, any in-depth questions around damages, I, I, would, I would refer to our lawyers because uh, I don't think my, my, my knowledge is, um, is great enough to talk about that. But um, that's one of the main points from the Republic of, of Ireland that we think is very important. And, and the other key plank of the, con the concerns that you've raised in relation to financial support is I think precisely what you just alluded to with the letter from Tony and Doran, the absence of any financial provision for the bereaved other than widows, widowers, long-term partners, civil partners. So for people such as you, individuals such as you, who lost a parent with all the consequences that had for you, or people such as, again, the number of witnesses we've heard from who lost a child no payments in terms of financial assistance for them and that, that's been a theme of your campaigning as I understand it well I, I personally have tried to avoid getting into campaigning on the support schemes themselves to any great extent because we, we've, we've put as, as I said earlier in my evidence I, I, I would, don't see that as, as, as an end but that being said, I mean, it's disgraceful that the, 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 the one aspect of this that, that I see as really unjust is I do, rightly or wrongly, tend to look at it on a family level. And so the current situation means that there are, in light of this recent announcement, there will be bereaved families, to put it that way, that receive tens of thousands of pounds a year. 
I, do, I make no judgment on whether or not that amount is appropriate. I would suggest not, hence why we can, are continuing to campaign for compensation. But the, the point I'm making is there will be other bereaved families, and in my view, some of the worst impacted, and I will specifically name Lauren Palmer here, her father's dead, her mother, who was also infected, is dead. And she, she stands to receive, that family stands to receive a big fat zero, no support. And how, how is there any fairness in that? You know, tens of thousands of pounds on one hand to one family, zero to you. And that, to me, that just blows my mind. And, and likewise, to those like Colin and Denise, who have lost their children. And I, met, I saw the impact that my dad's death had on his mother and father. Totally wrong as well. And I, yes, it, it needs, it does need to be fixed. You um, took issue, I think is possibly one way of putting it, with um, what was said in an autobiography by Kenneth Clark. Yes. Um, J-E-V-A 5065, please, Shomek. So this is an extract from kind of blue, Mr. Clark's, Lord Clark's autobiography. Um, I think you may have taken issue with a number of aspects of it, I don't know, but for present purposes, am I right in understanding it's what we see on the third paragraph of this page about well, compensation? That was ultimately what this resulted in being changed, but just to outline a number of the things that, that I would take issue with, so the beginning of, I guess, the second paragraph, one tragic aspect. It says, no, one tragic aspect of the epidemic was because initially no one understood that the disease was transmitted by body fluids. I take issue with that sentence. I take issue with the sentence that follows that. Every haemophiliac in the country received frequent blood transfusions from the National Health Service. I mean, I, I could unpick that, but I think it's obvious. Not every haemophiliac received frequent treatment. And beyond that, they weren't receiving blood transfusions. Going down a couple of lines, starting the sentence starting very quickly. Well, those two words, very quickly before our scientists and doctors appreciated that blood supplies needed to be treated to be safe. More than 1,200 haemophiliacs in Britain contracted HIV. I would suggest it is not the case that all 1,200 people infected with HIV were infected before scientists or doctors appreciated there was a, that there was a problem. And in fact, that sentence is in complete contrast to the legal advice that was given to the Department of Health, which I, I can't go to the document, but it was highlighted in the In Cold Blood documentary broadcast on ITV in September last year. And then we come on to this other disputed line. He says, the haemophiliacs who spent the rest of their lives with this disease were eventually given compensation. Clearly they weren't, because we're still campaigning for that now. And also, going down the page, a few more lines, the sentence beginning, when I became the only health minister. When I became the only health minister from that time, still prominent in the public eye, these campaigners usually named me in their campaigns because it improved their prospects of publicity. I, I have no concern about our prospects of publicity when it comes to Ken Clark, I think this demonstrates ego, perhaps, to, to take that 
view. And then also going down another three or so lines, he talks about Simon Glen Arthur, who he says was the minister responsible for this area. The sentence, Simon behaved impeccably throughout the crisis, but unfortunately he had acted on the medical and scientific advice given to him. I have little doubt the inquiry has access to the various letters sent by Dr. Peter Foster when he was at the ASTMS to Lord Glen Arthur telling him that factor concentrates uh, should be withdrawn and we should stop importing product from America due to the risk of AIDS and the various rebuttals uh, he received. So to say the medical and scientific advice in somehow was that that shouldn't happen is wrong because the, the documentary evidence doesn't support it. So there's a lot about this page I, I don't like. And you instructed solicitors um, who wrote to the publishers. Yes. Um, is this right? What it resulted in was an amendment in relation to the reference to compensation. Yes. I mean, ideally, we would have liked to have changed basically this whole page. Um, but the, the main reason why we didn't go on is myself and, and literally about 12 or 15 other people together raised, I think, about six or £900 to pay the firm in question to send a letter before action and, and to do a little bit of correspondence afterwards. But we, would, we wouldn't have had the money to, to, to actually go through with this um, at, at that stage. So we accepted a small victory by him agreeing to remove the word compensation and um, left it there. Last question on compensation. We can take that down. Thank you, Shane Mick. Co compensation is, it would appear, now actively under consideration through the appointment of the independent reviewer, mentioned a few moments ago, being something that, as it were, came out of the blue a little. Um, could we just look at one document? Um, it's a parliamentary question and answer from yesterday or the day before. RLIT 40661. And if we look at the bottom half of the page, so the date's the 7th of June, so three, three or four days ago, but this week. Henny Morgent, um, um, sorry, can we just go back, can we just see the question? We just go back up, sorry, show me. Um, the question um, posed by Kevin Jones to ask the, Dutch, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister for the Cabinet Office whether people affected by contaminated blood products will have access to legal representation for the Infected Blood Compensation Framework Review. And then we can see um, the answer by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Penny Mordaunt. The Compensation Framework Study will provide advice on potential compensation framework design and solutions to government. It is important that Sir Robert Francis QC, the independent reviewer, is able to complete his work as quickly as thoroughness allows. You might have copyright in that phrase, Sarah, I'm not sure. At the outset of the infected blood inquiry, the then Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster decided that it was overwhelmingly in the public interest that legal representation for infected and affected core participants in the inquiry should be funded by government and without means testing. This funding will continue until the conclusion of the inquiry. However, this study, so the Sir Robert Francis Independent Compensation Framework Review, is quite separate from the inquiry. Sir Robert will want to hear directly from infected and affected people and put them at the heart of the process. Legal representation will not be required in order to put forward views. So it would appear from this, and the reason I'm raising it with you, Jason, is not just because it, it, the, the time timing in terms of this is an announcement made this week, but you've, you've made some observations in your statement about funding for legal representation for the early stages of the inquiry process. Um, um, there may be an echo of that here. You identified, uh, you'd identified the problems that arose through not, or might arise through not having legal representation at, in the early stages of the inquiry process. Do you have any, any observations or thoughts or concerns about this announcement, this recent announcement, that there'll be no funding for legal representation for the infected and affected 
in terms of participation in Sir Robert Francis's review? Well, <clears throat> according to Penny Morden, we've now all developed the ability to be PI lawyers and can make schedules of loss and heads of loss. Clearly, we're not, and we can't do that. People are sick and they are dying, and to expect us to be able to do that is wrong. And to give context to this as well, on the day the written ministerial, um, sorry, it wasn't a written ministerial announcement, on the day that the Compensation Framework Review um, chairperson, Sir Robert Francis QC, was announced, there was a Zoom meeting organized by the APPG Penny Mordant joined that meeting. I attended it along with a variety of others, including the Haemophilia Society and other campaigners and a number of MPs. Penny Mordant joined that meeting and began to explain the detail of what we now know about that compensation framework review. And she said, oh, I, I'm saying this now because I wanted to give you guys the scoop on what's going on, you know, trying to make us feel important and like we were on some inside track. But of course, in the days of the internet and us not being completely stupid, despite what they may think, the government had press released it on their website about a minute before she began to say, oh, we're giving you the inside scoop. And actually, despite the differences I may have with the Haemophilia Society, Clive Smith did take Penny Borden to task about that, and I think he was right to. Um, on that Zoom meeting, I thankfully had the chance to ask Penny Morden this very question. I asked her, will victims and families have access to legal representation? And she gave this answer. Oh, I don't think you'll need that it will be okay, they want to hear from you directly. And, and one of the justifications Penny gave me for that, she said, we don't want this to be some long, drawn-out bureaucratic process. I rebutted her on that, and I said, surely, for 2,000 people to make their own representations to this process will result in exactly that happening, as opposed to, and I suggested, taking those legal firms that represent core participants in this inquiry, making the representations. And I, I didn't then have the opportunity to, to make a further rebuttal, but it, it didn't seem like she agreed with, with my view on that either. Then obviously, naturally, I should probably mention the fact that we all heard when Matt Hancock gave evidence, he said something quite different to what is outlined here. And he said, yes, we should have that. So, like the Ken Clark, Hugh Rossi letters, we have two government ministers saying different things. One of them is wrong, and weirdly for Matt Hancock, one of them is right. And I hope that Penny Morden does reverse the government's position on this because it's wrong to expect sick, dying, bereaved, injured people to become PI lawyers and to be expected to know the ins and outs of common law damages and compensation. The last matter, right? Uh, I, I think perhaps I, I should just say this, that it, it's uh, independent uh, of this inquiry, but we do expect that Sir Robert Francis will come uh, to give evidence here uh, and explain uh, what his review uh, amounts to. Uh, and of course, uh, any proceedings here uh, are, are open to the, will be uh, um, a forum in which the core participants will be represented. They will be represented in the way that they have been at uh, appropriate expense. Uh, and I would expect if submissions arise uh, that there are plenty of 
highly experienced PI lawyers um, involved in the inquiry from all parties uh, who can make appropriate representations to me. Yes. So that that's all I think I have to say uh, at the moment. That, that will, of course, be after Sir Robert has produced his report. Yes. Um, and as I understand it, um, the, the, your concern is about input into the report. Yes, correct. Obviously, it's a question of process, and, and the, what I'm talking about comes after the proposals are, are, <coughs> are produced. Yes. Um, the, the last matter I had to ask you, and, um, Jason, is, is just in relation to the question of a memorial. And you told us this morning <coughs> when I was asking you about um, um, what had happened to you personally, about the fact that there isn't somewhere that you have to go and... Um, mourn your father. Yes. But you've raised the broader point with central government, I think with the Department for Culture, Media and, and Sport, about funding for a memorial for all those um, affected um, by what happened. What, what response did you get? I'm just going to find... We, I think we've probably got it to put on screen, actually. J-E-V-A... Five zero six nine, please, Shamik. I've got at underscore triple zero six. It's not the response, but I think it's an insight into the thinking. Okay, go to page six, Shamik, and see. Is that the email to the Department of Health? This is the correct document, yeah. So, after the second dash, they say, and this is an in internal, this is from Department of Culture, Media and Sport to the Department of Health, because, to put some context on this, I'd written to DCMS, they'd come back and, to paraphrase, they weren't fans of the idea and they suggested that funds could be raised privately for such a memorial. And I'd then written back to them and said, you should speak to the Department of Health. I don't think you understand what the contaminated blood scandal is. Again, I'm paraphrasing it, a longer letter. So they say here, we don't decide who should and shouldn't have memorials, but can only advise how they might put to do it themselves. He, as in me, He's wanting some kind of recognition of what he regards as a Department of Health mistake. That's the most of their thinking, as in the, the Department of Culture, Media and Sports thinking I've seen in relation to this. It, it saddens me greatly, and I, I, I said something around about this in my statement that heard Bill talking this week about how in Scotland they're, you know, I've, and I've seen the fundraisers online for the Scottish Memorial Fundraiser. It's, it's a very noble effort. You know, I, I get it. But it's disgraceful that that's going on. And I think the reality is that what, in my view, would be an appropriate memorial for something where thousands of people have been harmed and have died you don't raise that money by doing charity fund runs and not to undermine them in any way. This needs to be a proper memorial funded by central government. And as I say in my statement, they have central government funds have been used for memorials to things like the Bali bombings, the 7 7 bombings, um, where, where the scale of those disasters, and I don't try to take away from them in any way, but the scale in terms of the numbers involved are no way near the contaminated blood scandal. And there's been nothing. And so, yes, we have the Birch Grove. I went there recently. I think it's very important, and it should be there. But again, and I applaud everyone involved in, in that effort, and I can see why it was needed. But again, a piece of stone in the middle of a wood in Swindon is, is not the place that this community should have. It's not appropriate. What's clearly appropriate is something 
in a central... I think there should be something in London. And I, and I think I mentioned in my statement that I believe it was with the, Bar, the, the Bali bombings memorial that was placed outside of the Foreign Office as a reminder of what can happen when not all steps that, that could or should be taken are. I think something near the Department of Health, even as a reminder of what they've done, might be appropriate. I don't know. I think it would be open to this community to decide. But I don't think anything that's, that's been done to date or is on the cards currently to be done it, it is the appropriate memorial. I, I think we need something proper. And you put it in, in these terms in your statement, Jason. This is incredibly important for many of those infected and affected. It would go a long way to helping people to feel that the scandal is not forgotten. This should not be a cheap gesture or raised through crowdsourcing, and then you refer to the Bali Memorial um, and um, the memorial for the 52 victims of the London bombings, and say there's a substantial and respectable memorial that reflects the gravity and scale of what has happened should be established in the memory of all those who have died from the infected blood scandal and the costs of this should be funded by the government. Yes. So those are the questions I um, have for Jason. I'm sorry it's been another longish day, but clearly we need to take a break now to check whether there are um, any suggestions for further questions, either from Jason's own representatives or from the legal representatives of core participants. So shall we say quarter past five? And uh, it will be quarter past five. Yes. <laughs> quarter past five. Thank you.